Okay, so people start to join. Let's give several minutes still before everyone will get in. There's so, someone I know. Uh, ah, pr probably, hopefully. <laughs> We can speak first minutes about the weather. How is the weather in, in Geneva now? <laughs> cold, cold. Maybe not as bad as Vienna, though. Well, where are, you, where are you now? I'm in Graz, actually. Hi. So it's uh, it's probably what it was freezing uh, some weeks ago, but now it's very uh, now it is very very warm. I mean, I, I have no chance to enjoy this warmness, but from the window it looks very. <laughs> it looks very nice. <laughs> so you haven't been out at all in in one week, or? Yeah, a bit more. Uh, yeah, so kind of. Uh, yeah, no, no, a bit less. Uh, so, and if everything is fine, Saturday will be out. So uh, probably let's start. So hello everyone. Um, hello everyone. Uh, very happy to uh, to 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 uh, to welcome you tonight at uh, Vienna. University at Virtual uh, Technical University of Vienna. Uh, my name is Artem Kitaev, and I'm very um, uh, honored to introduce you tonight, uh, Leopold Bancini. Um, Leopold Bancini, uh, founder of practice Leopold Bancini Architects, which is uh, based in uh, Geneva, in Switzerland. But uh, the geography of the projects of this office expands uh, far uh, beyond the uh, borders of city of Geneva, country of Switzerland, and even Europe. Uh, and spheres of their interest um, goes even broader. So the architecture uh, finds place between politics, uh, environment, uh, technology. Uh, dress architecture is a form of social action. Um, Probably many of you know uh, um, excellent works uh, done by practice called Bureau and uh, Leopold Bancini um, together with Daniel Zemarvik was a founder of this practice. And now Leopold uh, continues uh, as uh, uh, Leopold, uh, Leopold Bancini architects. Uh, Leopold as well uh, combines uh, successful um, architectural practice with an interesting academic career. Uh, currently, he's teaching in uh, Academia di Architettura, or how do you say it, in Mindrisio. Um, nevertheless, any introduction sounds now to me, seem to me formal uh, before this interesting, exciting lecture. So without further delay, uh, I'm very uh, grateful to welcome Leopold Bancini. Uh, Leopold, please start. The stage is yours. Okay. Thank you so much. I hope you can all uh, hear me. Uh, First, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry for not being there in person. Uh, it was due to uh, several reasons, but uh, yeah, I'm sad not to be uh, with you, uh, Artem, and not to be with you with all the students and everyone, but uh, hopefully another time. It's always a bit strange to speak in front of a computer. I try to avoid it, but uh, anyway, today there is no choice. Um, maybe I will immediately share my screen and start the lecture. Actually, maybe before I start it, I just want to say that uh, I, I usually do a classic lecture going through uh, projects uh, almost chronologically. But just before the holiday in the end of December, the student association in Mendrisio in the school asked me to do a lecture, but they had a very specific brief. And the brief was that uh, each person they invite, they invite uh, every few months an architect has to present in his practice through five objects, five objects that somehow are crucial for the practice or that they would take on a remote island if that's the only thing they could take. And uh, it was a specific exercise uh, and I, I will not continue long for this lecture, but uh, I thought it was interesting because uh, through this object, they actually the student got to know a bit more about uh, the practice, personal stories and not only the usual images that, uh, uh, we see online and uh, I thought it was nice so if you don't mind I will actually do the a similar presentation uh, and yeah it's I mean it's I, I tried that once it was funny with the students so I, I'll try again the, the same lecture and let's see what happens so 
here is the screen. Sorry, just a second. Uh, okay. So I go straight into the topic, the five, uh, five objects, and uh, here they are. I will describe them and each one of them will be the excuse to talk about a few projects in my practice and a few thoughts in my practice. But, uh, just so you know, the first one is a, a T25 uh, Torx drill bit. The second one is a, a medium base membrane. The third one is a, uh, is a stone. Uh, the fourth one is my new bike, uh, uh, bullet uh, Harry vs. Larry uh, cargo bike. And uh, the very last one, the fifth one, is a beautiful bottle of beer with a little handkerchief in it. And of course, this will be a bit of an excuse to speak about production, culture, economy, infrastructure, and politics, which, uh, as you say, Artem, I think are topics that come back in my practice. And uh, before I, I jump into these objects, um, I always like to start lectures uh, with a couple pictures to somehow place my practice uh, in perspective. I started a bit more than 10 years ago now. Uh, and coming out of school, I think there was a few important uh, events that somehow shaped not only my practice, but I believe the generation uh, of architects. I think each generation of architects somehow have their own trauma. And uh, my trauma, I would say, was I finished and it was the middle of the financial um, housing crisis, so the early one, and I, I was in Spain at the moment, and that's the kind of landscape you would find. I think most of projects were stopped. Um, the economy had really showed its weaknesses, and I think it was very clear for this generation of architects that they will uh, have to foresee a different type of future and a different way of, of building. And the second element that happened, uh, this is an image of the city of Fukushima after the, uh, after the incident. Uh, and I think, of course, uh, there's been many ecological and, and, and economical turn points. But for me, at that moment, Fukushima was really a, an important one uh, to also make me think that we had to practice architecture differently and also think of a different relation with our uh, environment and with our technologies. And in general, I think that developed, a, let's say, a group or a generation of architects were definitely less uh believing in this kind of star architect of the 90s trying to go for huge projects i don't think we we ever thought we would get that kind of project uh so we developed a slightly different type of practice which is uh based on smaller project which was um definitely more collaborative i think that's very important that uh, we started collaborative collaborating with other architects with other professions uh other friends uh, so definitely smaller practice, um, and uh, yeah, I think very different ambitious uh, ambition. Sorry, uh, an interest for economy. Uh, when I say economy, it's not only um, you know an economy of money, but also an economy of means, uh, an ecological economy. I think as well. Um, so all these questions became more evident, and uh, the title of the lecture that actually that I gave today, uh, "Tears in the Club." Uh, it's a reference to some of my interests, but it's, it's also a, a, a pop song for those who know who came out recently from a, an artist that I admire. Uh, and when I look at uh, young artists and the way they are able to collaborate and, and, and go around the world and, and yeah, practice, I'm always envious. And I always think, how can I practice architecture the same way? You know, it is very contemporary, but at the same time, very free, very mixed. And it's not a heavy, you know, you don't need a big office. You can collaborate around the world. And uh, I'm very uh, admiring of that. So that's one of the reasons for the title. But I will start. So the first object, uh, this little drill bit, it's funny because as you understood, I'm very interested in construction. I enjoy to do it myself. It's been a big part of the, my practice. Uh, and when you start building by yourself, I think the first, the first time you build something, you forgot half of the elements and you have to go back to the hardware store 25 times. And then the second time you get ready, you have all of the material, but then you realize you have a lot of friends, you have material, everything is there, but you only have you know, one power tool. And then everyone is waiting to have the, the drill and everything gets slow. And 
So the next time you get ready, you have all the material, you have all the, the power tools, but there's always something missing. And in the end, I think the smaller thing that always kind of fucks you up is this T25 drill bit that somehow everyone keeps in their pocket because they don't want to, they know it's going to disappear at some point and it's always lost. And everyone, the whole construction site stops because you don't have any more this drill bit. So I think it's a very important element and I usually keep one in my pocket. So it has become a key element in my practice. And of course, this is, as I say, a bit of an excuse to talk about the interest of uh, my practice. But for me, construction has really been a, a big part, a big part of it. And the idea that you can self-produce some of the architecture, uh, at least that you, be, that you can be part of the production of it, that you can share uh, this moment with builders, with professionals, or with friends. Uh, but for me, it's even more than that is once you become very, you become very aware of the steps that are uh, necessary to build something, I think you start designing for it. You, you, you don't design a space, but you design a way of building a space. And for me, that's, that's, I think, very important in my practice. When I think about the project, I really think about the steps that are going to be needed to build it. And I try to simplify this because I, the more I build, the more I'm aware of how hard it is to build. And I think as architect, we often forget that it's, it's a dangerous job, it's a heavy job, you know, construction can be very painful. And I think uh, we have to be aware of that. And we also have to find solutions uh, that are respectful of, of you know, the, the artisan. So this is a, a beautiful picture of what is called uh, barn raising. It's the Amish community in the US and they, you know, they built everything themselves with that machine and they see construction as a, group moment where the whole village or the whole community comes together and built a new bar and they do that extremely quick and they do this as a celebration so here on the picture you have the woman at the bottom they are part of it uh, men as well and uh, everyone comes together and help one of the member of the community building a new bar and i think that's a very beautiful moment and uh, this is something that I, I often try to do. And maybe a first example is a workshop we did last summer for Horse Festival in Belgium. And it was a, quite an ambitious project. But it was built entirely by a, a team of young designers, young architects during a week. So a very short time with very unexperienced uh, workers. Uh, but they were very willing. And we managed to build quite a big uh, barn structure in one week. And this is typically the kind of commission that I get. You know, when horse called me, I, I didn't know anyone there. So I was surprised and said, ah, do you wanna do you wanna do a stage for the festival in the summer? I said, yeah, of course. And then I realized why they were asking me because there was basically no budget. Uh, they had, you know, no money to do it, no, no material. And this is the kind of project usually I get contacted for. So in this case, I think the great, uh, uh, quality of the project is they had a pavilion from the year before designed by Fala, it's called the Feather Stage, which was uh, well published. Maybe you've seen it, a beautiful pavilion. And they had dismantled it, but they had kept the material. So we decided to build everything reusing the material from Fala. So there was a big reflection, of course, on, on how can we reuse all this material? How can we classify it? And we really tried to work only with what was left from the year before. And this is a picture of the, the workshop. So everyone was sleeping in tents. And as I said before, when you build with a small group, with no machine, you have to design and think that, you know, the structure, this is a few of the, the trusses that you see in the picture. You know, they had to be designed in size that we could handle as a, as a small group. And this is the pavilion coming together. So this kind of hut uh, that proposed a very uh, primal experience Techno, it was of course very heavy techno in there, and we, we decided to put no floor. So the, the pavilion of Fala was really a dense floor, a beautiful floor. There was no ceiling, uh, very decorative. And in, in this case, we decided to use the same material, but completely transform it into uh, a completely different experience. And another project to also illustrate this kind of practice, this is a small chalet in the mountains. And here again, we were asked to participate to an um, artist residency in the mountain to somehow think about architecture. And we use this excuse to actually build in the mountain. So it's a, it's a little wooden cabin and it's surrounded by uh, a shot concrete to somehow blend into this strange 
uh, landscape. In this case, it's called Verbier. It's a big ski resort. So it looks like a beautiful mountain, but the closer you get, the more there is concrete everywhere. And here it is. Uh, so we built everything ourselves and then it, it was brought on site with a small truck. And another example of self-construction, this is a, a building in Australia. Uh, I spent confinement or COVID in Australia last year, uh, and I had to invent myself a, a bit of a project. Uh, so I decided to build a, um, a little cabin. And in this case, it, the place was only accessible by boat. So I had to find a really light and simple material that I could handle myself. And in this case, it was the smallest wood beams. It's one inch by one inch, so a bit more than two centimeter, I think. Um, by two, uh, yeah, a bit more than two by two. Um, I have a DAF now, maybe a bit, yeah, a bit more. Um, and the entire building had to be built using this material. So here you see the, the result. It's a very light uh, structure and it's all thought, uh, the size, the dimension, the weight, so that I could build it myself. And here you see the interior. Uh, and you see the relation with the rock. I will come back to the rock. As you can see, there's already a few reference to, to rocks. And another uh, small project, I'm presenting all the small projects. Maybe this I didn't say, but uh, we tend also with uh, Viewer A earlier, but all along my, my career, I've done a lot of small projects, uh, often self-built, but they are a great, uh, in, in my opinion, they are a great opportunity to test ideas. Uh, and they go fast, uh, often with limited budget, but you can take risk in a way, uh, which probably you couldn't do if you were doing a large scale building. So in this case, it was just uh, an interior design for graphic designers in Geneva. And we went to the hardware store and selected the two cheapest material we could find. One is little garden concrete slab. They are not even reinforced. And the second one is uh, 40 by 40 millimeter uh, rough cut pine wood, uh, beads. So here you see the structure. It was a big bleacher, or it still is, uh, that they were using uh, for the office as both well a conference space, library, etc. Okay, I'll jump to the, the second object. As I say, it's a strange format, and it's even stranger that I have, I don't see anyone in front of me. I only have your face at them, and I don't have any reaction, so I cannot tell when you are completely bored or, but anyway, I'll keep on talking. Uh, we're not bored <laughs> you are <laughs> you're the only one i see uh, anyway i'll keep on talking uh, this is um so the second object is uh, ah i see people nice great to see you i feel less alone thank you <laughs> bonjour <laughs> oh very nice thank you um so the second object that I find very important for my practice are uh, membrane, which are of course the base element for a speaker. And uh, all the rest in the speaker you discover is not so hard to build, but uh, the membrane, of course, it's, it's quite complex. So you have to buy the membrane. And there's a big relation with music, I think in general in my, in my practice, first of all, because I always listen to music when I practice <laughs> or when I design. And I always think that I could have never chosen a line of work where I cannot listen to my music while, while I, I do it. Otherwise, I would get super bored. So music is important at any moment when, when I work. Uh, but it's also an important part of our practice because we, from early on, we started working a lot for festivals uh, and, and working around the theme of clubs, of music, of party. And for me, music is important, but it's also very important to realize that architecture, or at least spaces, can be made with everything. And I really believe that sound or a good speaker is the first thing that creates a space. It's a virtual space, but it's definitely a space. When you are at a party, you are all in the same space. And, and for me, that's a very important uh, uh, understanding of, of what is a space. And uh, through my practice, I realized also looking back uh, through this uh, weird exercise that I've built a lot of speakers and that it keeps on coming back in, in the project that I, that I designed. So this is a very early project that I did for the Musée du Quai Branly in Paris, this big design by Jean Nouvel kind of floating over the ground. And in this case, uh, they really didn't know how to use the, this big garden. Um, and they asked me to help them. And uh, the first thing I proposed was to bring a few uh, caravans 
at the time, France was in a big fight against uh, the Roma community. So I thought, uh, you know, let's bring a few of these caravans. And then we built a sound system. And, and we built it ourselves and realized it didn't work so badly. And it actually became a, an important place with, with beautiful concerts and DJ coming there. They had a great uh, lineup during the summer in the, in the museum. Uh, so it was a success. And here you see a few of the other caravans. This one was under the museum and was a stage for uh, spoken words and concerts. Another example of this festival, I think somehow we, uh, we started working for a lot of festival in Geneva. And uh, this was one called Antigel, a winter festival. And as usual, very little budget. And in this case, we just had enormous amount of pallets because it was a, a train depot. And we built this, it was a large scale club, but uh, we built this four or five meter wall with thousands and thousands of pallets just stuck together and to create this uh, very big club. Another example for the Montreux Jazz Festival, a beautiful festival as well. And in this case, we did a few different projects for them, but this one was just a, a very long uh, semicircular bar, kind of a diner, very inspired by American diner. Uh, and it was uh, an, a main bar of the festival. And another speaker uh, project, I, I was myself surprised when I put them together to realize how many sound system I've built. And this one was built in, uh, in Portugal, in our office at the time, for the Triennale, the Triennale, the architectural Triennale in Milano, in, um, sorry, in Lisbon is a, a beautiful event. And we were asked to do a side event and we use this as an excuse to open the door to a lot of the beautiful abandoned buildings that are in Lisbon. And we were always very curious having our office there, trying to visit. And we thought that, you know, the Triennale was a great key to open those doors. So we, we proposed to the Triennale to organize party in all the abandoned building that we wanted to visit. And that was uh, basically every week or every two weeks during the, the whole time of the Triennale. And what we did is built a, a space, but basically the space was a sound system. So it's, you see here all the elements and they came together uh, into really a club. So when they were really all together, it created a very small scale club, but they could also expand and adapt to the, the different spaces. And inside some huge spaces and inside the huge spaces, we were really creating a club only with the speakers. So we're really creating a space with the sound. Another example, quite similar, but in this case, we actually created a space, but just with an inflatable structure. Uh, this was a a design inspired by American underground shelter, this kind of survivalist shelter that you can buy online to bury in your, in your garden. Um, but in this case, it was also used as a bar and as a club, a completely dark PVC membrane with a very strange atmosphere in there, very sweaty and, and hot, uh, but it worked really well. And of course, it, at the end of the party, it could just be deflated and, and brought in another space. And then, Another a small example with a, a speaker. This is a project uh, at the Centre Pompidou. I think I talked about it with some of you in the class today. Um, and this is a project for a workshop space on the fourth floor at the Centre Pompidou. Uh, it's the permanent collection and, and they organize workshop, in this case with adults. So it's um, professional workshops and they needed a space for that. And what we proposed was a very technical uh, response. It's an elevated floor, but the floor opens and you can find all the functions in it. And this, of course, allows uh, the public to completely close the floor and have a full space for performance and for uh, other uses. So you can see here, if you open one of the trap, you have a, a little uh, kind of cocktail kitchen bar. Another one opens into a weird inflatable nuclear power plant. That was to make fun of the French and their love for uh, nuclear power plants. Another one is a strange garden, in, in this case, uh, uh, with psychedelic cactus. And then, of course, there was also a speaker. So if you know where it is at the Centre Pompidou, you can go there, open. You can plug your, uh, your phone and you can start a party at any time on the fourth floor. And then the last example of this object, uh, it's a project that I quite like in, that we did in, in Zurich. We were invited by a student from the school who organized a small festival, cultural festival on this parking lot that was gonna be uh, destroyed a few months later to build a high rise. And in this case, we had also a very small budget. At the time we were in Portugal and, and we realized that pink marble was 
not so expensive when you were getting it directly from the, the builder. So we went there with our budget and we asked Senor Joao how much marble he could give us with the budget we had. Uh, that's what we got for uh, quite a big uh, plate. Uh, we sent them to Zurich and we made the most fancy uh, urinal, urinal, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, uh, for a festival. So of course you could come there, pee, but it became also immediately the, the places to, to graph and to put your name on. So it became an important graph wall. So I, I jump to the next object. Um, third object, it was this, um, this stone. And of course, uh, I mean, I have a personal obsession with uh, stones and, and nature. I mean, as a kid, I had a big collection of stone and it keeps on coming back in my practice. There's always a rock and I, every time there's a rock on a site, I get quite obsessed with it. But I realized that I'm also you know, very interested in the way uh, human plays value in this kind of natural element or representation of nature. And in the case of uh, this kind of Chinese meditation rock who became uh, also popular in Japan later on, um, I still am fascinated the value about the value that was put into them. And there is all this story of, you know, kings or lords who were exchanging entire country for a rock. And in the end, uh, I think even more than, you know, precious rocks, these rocks are just the, the only value that there is, is a creative one, and it's the one people decide to put it. So they say, no, this, this rock is really beautiful. It's, it's worth the whole country. Or this one is really beautiful. I exchange it against your house. And I find that really fascinating. And in, in general, I also got quite fascinated into um, precious stone, maybe mainly when I was in Australia, where it's a, a part of the culture there. And I find that really interesting, again, to question what is our you know, value system? What do we value? Um, and another element that I think is also very linked to that was uh, in the case of Bahrain was uh, pearls. Uh, and I use that as an excuse to speak a bit about the project in Bahrain. But when I, I moved there, I realized how important the pearls were. And once again, it's an element that somehow we decided has an enormous value, but it's also hard to explain uh, why. And in the case of Bahrain, it's a bit of a specific history because uh, pearl were a huge part of the e economy. We don't realize how important they were at some point uh, in history and how much value was put in them. Uh, but it can become really crazy. Uh, uh, an import, like a, a natural pearl necklace can, can be worth millions. Uh, but of course, this was completely destroyed once we invite, entered the first cultured pearls and then, of course, synthetical pearls. And the cultural pearls were only invented in the 50s, or I think at the end of the 40s, but uh, they were only starting to commercialize them in the 50s in Japan. So the, the technology to, to grow pearls is very new. And until then, there was really only natural pearls and you had to dive uh, for days and months. The diver in Bahrain would leave to the sea for three months and dive all day at important death and open thousands and thousands of wild oysters until they would find a pearl. And here you see a picture of the, the, one of the last divers uh, in the 60s. Of course, this, this uh, profession almost completely disappeared. It was also a very hard profession, um, but uh, it was still there in the 60s, even in the 70s in Bahrain. And uh, this, uh, as I say, it's an excuse to also speak about my relation with Bahrain. As Artem say, I, I use architecture as a, let's say, as an excuse to travel as well. Uh, it's always been a, a big interest of mine, discovering the world and, and architecture allows me to do that. So I'm always eager to find projects in places that I don't know. And I find that through architecture and through mainly through a building site, you get uh, an amazing understanding of a, of a country. You get to understand the economy. Of course, you get to understand, you know, workers, how these things work, the material. Uh, and I find that it's a, it's a great way to understand a, a place. So in Bahrain, it's one of the places where I built uh, several projects and that I really enjoyed. And through this project, I really uh, understood, of course, not everything, but some of the, some of the cultural elements of, the, of this fascinating country. Um, and I will talk about the first project that I did there, which was a collaboration 
who is Noura Al-Sayeh. Uh, she's Palestinian. She's a good friend of mine. We studied together as well. And uh, she moved to Bahrain and, and works for the Ministry of Culture there. And uh, the first project we did was for the uh, Venice Biennale. It was together with uh, Harry Guger. Uh, and we did that for the 2010 Venice Biennale, 2010. So just uh, when I was out of school. And this is a, a picture of how Bahrain was. This is at the end of the 60s. Uh, and I was always impressed when I, I saw these pictures for the first time because Bahrain doesn't look like this at all anymore. But when you look at that, it's really, it's almost like Venice, no? It looks absolutely uh, beautiful. And I think what's very clear there is that there was a very strong relation between the architecture and the sea. As I said before, pearls were a huge economy, trading, fishing, basically mainly things that had a strong relation with the sea. And with the arrival or the discovery of the petroleum, which was the, Bahrain was the first country to discover it, and the, the discovery of cultural pearls in Japan, uh, slowly the economy shifted. And one of the first things that was brought was of course cars. And what you see on the, on the picture there, um, on the left is one of the first motorway built around this beautiful area and the, the water is very shallow there, but they, they started reclaiming land first to build motorway and then to build infrastructures. Uh, what you see here is the Gulf Hotel is the, the first uh, hotel on a land reclamation. And now this hotel, which was actually shaped like in the shape of a, a net as a relation with the sea, is now in the middle of the country, like uh, miles away from the sea. And what you see here on the, can you see my, my pointer? Yeah. Uh, this is a typical image of the, of the urban planning in Bahrain, where you find here, uh, this is the old city. This area, you can still feel this was built already on the sea. And then this is all land reclamation with uh, infrastructure, but also housing, a lot of different things. And then uh, all the famous motorway, the first one that was built, the second one. And what happened is a complete disconnection from the urban fabric, but also from the people uh, living in the historical center to the sea. And what Noura wanted to discuss in, the, in this first Biennale, sorry, it's a long story, but I, I tried to go back to the start, uh, was to, to talk about this, this, you know, this change that was very short. In the end, in, in 30, 40 years, uh, the life of people who were completely linked to the sea changed to a, a modern life where they had a car and, and were working in a, in a bank or in a mall. Uh, and what we decided to focus on is what you see at the bottom of these images. Uh, this is, of course, uh, reclaimed land. And you have all the small boats of the fishermen who are still there. They still have their boats. And what they do on these beaches that are fully private, there's no more, almost no more public beaches in Bahrain. Um, on these beaches, illegally, they built little houses to somehow go there during the day, not only to fish or not to, to live, but just to spend the day and be closer to the sea, closer to the sea breeze that is also cooler in the evening and just enjoy this relation to the sea. So here is an example of one of this uh, self-built shack and they are constantly destroyed and rebuilt somewhere else. And we decided that they were, and the people living there were a nice testimony of this quick change in urbanism. So we, together with the, the fishermen there, we decided to dismantle three of these huts, put them in a boat and ship them to Venice. Um, and uh, we did conducted interview with the fishermen there and we brought all of this to Venice. And here you can see one of the, actually the same hut uh, rebuilt in the Arsenale. And in there, uh, you had the interview with the fishermen who were simply explaining the story from their point of view. And this led to a few other projects in, in, in Bahrain. The second one that I did there was uh, actually uh, my friend Noura, she organized the first competition in Bahrain. It was an open competition. And the idea was to question here the relation with public space again, but specifically with the car. And it was to rethink this whole area. And uh, my job was to organize, uh, or my job with Noura was to organize um, the exhibition of the result of this competition. And in this case, we decided not to show them in a museum or, or in a cultural center, but to really bring the result in the space and to use this exhibition as a first excuse to start to transform this space. And uh, to do that or to transform public space, 
in Bahrain that was mainly uh, dedicated to car. The first thing we, we had to do was try to stop the car traffic. So that was the main part of the project, a long discussion with the police authority there to try to convince them to block the car traffic on, at certain time of the day. Um, and of course, to create a, a nicer environment. In this case, it was summer, so it was uh, quite hot. Uh, and, and we took an example from these are greenhouses in, in Bahrain and in, in uh, greenhouses are not there, not transparent to accumulate uh, heat like we have in Europe, but rather the opposite, they are just shading structure. So they are there to, to somehow lower the temperature. So we, we took this material, this reflective nets that you find in, in the agricultural field, and we covered a large area, I think about 6,000 square meter of the square, with this very light structure. So it's a very cheap and light structure. You see it here. Uh, created some furniture, tables to show the result of the competition. And what we did is uh, somehow create an exhibition in the public space, but also completely transform the use uh, temporarily of this public space. And you can see it here uh, in the evening. Part of it is already close to the traffic. There is still some cars, but it was this constant negotiation with, with the car traffic, trying to stop it. And as soon as it was stopped, somehow uh, with the shade, the, the square would fill with people. And the people uh, coming there were mainly uh, foreign workers, so Pakistani, uh, from Bangladesh, from India, uh, all the people who work in construction, and they have very little access to public space mainly because nowadays the public space, you need a car to go there, or it's a mall, which is semi-private and they don't feel welcome. So uh, this was a, uh, somehow a great opportunity for them to have a big public space where they could meet and discuss and chat, and it became extremely successful. And here you see it from the sky. Um, and then one last project in, in Bahrain, I did a, a few more, but this is the one that we finished not, not uh, long ago. Uh, and it's a project for uh, Bahraini weavers. So in, in the Bahraini culture, the men are weaving. And there's a few villages uh, in the country who are specialized in, in weaving. And in this specific village, there's a, still a few men doing it. Uh, but they didn't really have the facility for it. And uh, everyone was scared that the skill would completely disappear. So the, the Ministry of Culture decided to help uh, built a facility that was owned by the will, would be owned by the weavers, but so that they, they could somehow have a space where they could weave, but also uh, attract clients to sell what they were weaving, uh, and somehow uh, re revive the the skill. And in this case, uh, Barani weaver do it with a very simple uh, loom, and they do it by digging a hole in the ground. So it's quite an amazing uh, process. It just dig a hole in the ground and this allow to have the very long wire that they need at the level of the, of the ground. So somehow the ground becomes a table. Uh, and they do that in, in light structures, historically at least, uh, that are called arish and that are made with the, the date palm leaves. So when you take care of the date palm, you have to constantly cut leaves. And with these leaves, you see it here on the left, uh, you see a fence done with these leaves. So a lot of things were done with those leaves. And another important uh, element for the project is that in these villages, there used to be quite a few natural spring, and you see it there on the picture, uh, fresh water, and, and the kids would swim there and really enjoy the, this relation with the water. And now you have almost no more water in this area. The springs have died due to uh, land reclamation. And, uh, and in this case, that's two important elements we wanted to bring back to the project. And, so the first thing we did is found people who could still weave the, the arish. So this other arish that was produced for our project. So it's, it's also weaved. Um, and here you can see the first images of the, of the construction and of the project. And the project is very simple. It's just a very repetitive structure filled with arish, so a shading structure with some water feature under it. So trying to create a microclimate, kind of a covered garden that could be used by the, the village. Um, and everything that was needed for the project was somehow digged in the ground the same way that the weavers would do. So there are palm trees in the project, but there are also holes for the kitchen, for the shop, for weaving. Uh, and here you see a few of these holes, some of the water feature, features, but uh, also the kitchen, all the elements are somehow sunken 
as a reference to this very simple uh, act that was done by the weaver of digging in the ground to, to create a space. Uh, the fourth object, I think one before last, I, that was my bike. Um, but it's not only my bike, it's just bikes in, in general. And uh, I, I love bike. I mean, I think it's a great, uh, very simple and beautiful invention that can be used for amazing thing, as you can see on the picture. Um, but for me, it's also a constant reflection that I have on urbanism and architecture and the way it has been influenced by the car. And I think uh, we are at the end of a, a period. And as architects, especially you as young architect, I think we need to rethink the relation of architecture and the car. And you know, I have nothing against a car in itself, but what he has created, uh, I think it's, it's, it's uh, let's say, a catastrophe in many, many aspects. Um, and this is a thought that somehow comes back always in my in my reflection and in some of the project, of course, it was a very direct link. So this is a project we did when we had our office in Vietnam for a few months. Um, and the first thing we saw is how amazing they were, uh, amazingly, they were using bikes there. So together with a, a local welder, we decided to buy this kind of, to, sorry, to build this kind of extreme bike that was almost a, a, a little housing project and became a, a Fobo uh, place. And of course, it's something that I don't often talk about, but uh, I keep on saying that I do only small project. It's not really the case anymore. Uh, there's also larger projects, urban scale project. And these are two examples of urban, uh, urban projects, so urban design. And uh, in this case, of course, they are also reflection on the city. The first one that you see on the, on the left, this is during the construction, but it's a big public space, and in, in this space, we won the competition saying uh, or pretending or hoping that we could uh, get the car out and build a forest. And uh, of course, it's a very urban, it's in the middle of the city. There's the new uh, subway station there. There's a lot of uh, traffic and things happening, but uh, we still managed to plant 150 uh, trees, and somehow the traffic has to go between the trees. And, and of course, now it's already a little forest, but the project will only be finished in 50 years when the, the tree really take the size that they, they are supposed to have. And on the other side, this is another urban project that we are working on now. Uh, it's a beautiful place in Geneva where two river meet, uh, one straight uh, coming straight down from the mountain and the other one from the lake. So they have this completely different color and they meet in this very magical place. But it used to be an industrial area. You still see a um, a chimney at the back and it's a bus depot and we were asked to transform that and really rethink the, this urban area and this is also a very interesting project to somehow think the city of, of tomorrow. In this case we won the competition by simply putting a set of rules so it's a participative process uh, but the rules are that no material can come out of the site which is very difficult because it's a highly polluted site so that means all of the depollution had to, has to be done with uh, natural uh, phyto remediation or micro remediation, this kind of natural treatment of pollution, but also all of the bus depot has somehow has to be transformed and reused on site. And uh, of course, talking about the bike, I also realized that a lot of the project, a lot of houses and projects we did are in places that are not accessible by car. And I think I'm always attracted to this kind of projects that are complex. Uh, but in places that are somehow out of, of, of the car network. And the first one I present here is uh, one in Australia. Uh, in a, close by the other project that I presented, this was finished last week, actually. Uh, I have a few pictures, but the photographer only went there two days ago. Um, and this is a very strange location because you can only reach it by, by boat at high tide. So you also, you have to wait for the right moment in the tides, you have to find a boat and there's no water, no electricity on site. So it's a fully off the grid, self-sustainable house. And it was entirely built in wood by two carpenter. Uh, they did everything from the foundation uh, to the finishes uh, by hand with a little boat. Uh, so of course, as I said before, the ID, the constructive ID, the size of the wood beams, the size of the material, 
are completely linked to also the access and the workers themselves. In this case, the house is it's a very uh, steep site. We could not use any machinery, so there's, we are not touching the site, so the building somehow has to follow uh, the topography. So the building steps down all the way uh, and is built in a very systematic and simple uh, wood structure. And all of the structure is made with repurposed uh, hardwood. So amazing Australian wood that we never find here. Uh, beauty, really beautiful wood, extremely hard. Uh, and they are usually, so the, the pillars are cut in electrical poles. So when Australia decided to colonize, or well, when the British decided to colonize the territory, they uh, put electrical poles across the country and they cut the nicest uh, and straightest wood they could find to do that. And then they were replaced by steel poles. So you can still find these old poles and cut in them uh, in this old wood, recycle it, and, and you get really amazing old wood. And part of the wood is also reused from the uh, jetty that was there. And here you see, uh, in, in this case, usually I, when I do projects that are far away, as I said before, I really like to go there, spend a lot of time, uh, that's also why I have a very small and flexible office, so it allows me to do these kind of things. Um, in this case, because of uh, COVID and confinement, I could go there last uh, winter. It was very hard. I had to do two weeks in quarantine in a hotel, etc. But I had to leave at some point. And I could never go back. So we communicated mainly through the model. So you see a picture there of the model in the space of the construction. And... Uh, here is a picture of the model and of the reality on the other side. And uh, they were actually amazing carpenters. So they just followed everything extremely precisely. And uh, it worked amazingly, amazingly. Uh, I say it was all made in wood but because it's a fire prone area. All the exterior had to be cladded with a very thin fiber cement, uh, fiber cement sheets. And this is a regulation, uh, it's mandatory, but all the rest is built in wood, all of the structure. So here you see the building stepping down uh, the slope and a few a picture of the interior. Uh, it's just one very large window looking at the sea. Uh, all of the steel element, like the, the base of the chimney and the light were all uh, laser cut and are just assembled. So they don't need to be welded. And you see inside the, the dining room and all of the wood there is the leftover from the construction, also the stools and the, and the table are just made with the, the same wood. Another example is uh, this house in, in Switzerland. Uh, this was actually, it's, it's possible to access it by, by car, but it's right in front of the train station, uh, the industrial train station. There's, it's, there's about 20 tracks there. It's a very strange uh, site, quite similar to the one you, you, uh, you worked on in your studio. So a very interesting site. Uh, very urban and somehow uh, that's maybe a, just an anecdote but when we had to uh, do a building permit for this house uh, the city council told us no but it's, it's next to the train track it's going to be very loud you have to take special me measure for the noise so we had to employ an acoustician he put microphone uh, over a month and we did a study of the sound there and the conclusion was that even if there is 20 train tracks, it's still way more silent than when there is a small secondary road next to it. So in the end, the noise of the train, it's uh, at least at this speed and in, uh, in an industrial area really has absolutely no influence. Uh, so uh, in the end, they had to uh, uh, allow us to build what we wanted. So in this case, it's also a, a very light uh, structure. It's all built in wood. Uh, there is no foundation. Uh, I mean, there are foundation, but let's say there is no basement, which uh, doesn't seem strange, but in Switzerland, it's quite strange. Somehow people uh, insist on building heavy concrete basement with a lot of money and a lot of energy and a lot of concrete. In this case, we really work to have the smallest possible foundation. There are about uh, 50 by 50 uh, little uh, concrete blocks. And then on top of it, you have a full wood uh, structure and it's fully prefabricated. You see here a picture of the crane bringing the elements. So in one week, the, all the structure of the house was assembled on site. And in this case, I think this project also unites a few of the, the interests. It's, of course, uh, a very light and ecological uh, way of constructing. It's very cheap. Um, 
and I think these are always things that come back in the project. We have to work with uh, very cheap elements um, and think about that. But it's something that I really enjoy. I don't. I never see it as a constraint in my practice. I think it's just a. It's it's a great challenge. And in this case, um, sorry, I come back, but uh, it's a shed house, so it's a reference to a more uh, industrial architecture that you had in this area, but it's also allowed to, in terms of light, to have a completely closed surrounding because it's very close to some other buildings. Uh, but at the same time, what you see here through the hall is the interior. And, and with this shed, you have a very strong transparency. So in the house, uh, it is very bright, but it's very introverted. So it's a very urban house. And another example of a complex house is a house in Lisbon. Uh, and this house is also in a place that is not accessible by, by car. So it was a very uh, complex construction site. You see the house here is on the top of those stairs. So it's one of these crazy stairs in Lisbon, uh, but it's also an amazing, amazing location. So very urban, uh, but the road are only little paved stairs on all the ways to access to it. And in this case, we managed to put a crane. This is the highest point of the city. Uh, and this is the crane we use for the construction. So it was sitting on the highest place and was just long enough to reach a, a road with a truck next to a church. And then it could go above the church, above a few houses, and we could drop uh, some of the elements in the house. Uh, and this allowed us, uh, surprisingly, actually concrete is quite easy to bring in places that uh, are hard to access because you just need a tube. Uh, so you can uh, come and cast, if it's not prefabricated, if it's casted on site, uh, you can bring the concrete quite far away with a pressure tube. And then, uh, thanks to the crane, we could bring these large uh, elements of marble uh, built in a quarry not far. Um, and they are basically the only elements of the, of, of the project. You have this nucleus where you have the function, they are entirely built with solid marble, and that's it. So, of course, as I mean, I said before that marble is cheap in Portugal. It's true. It's actually surprisingly uh, cheap. What is expensive is to handle it, to transport it, to fix it. But uh, the material itself, especially blocks that are not perfect, uh, can be very cheap. Uh, but still, it has a price. So in this case, we really focus on this one material and we work with, they have a, a great, great craftsmanship when it comes to marble, a great knowledge. So we really focused on that uh, specific skill and worked with uh, companies who are really good in, in cutting the marble, bringing it and placing it. And that was quite amazing. And then the last object, and I, I stopped talking, this will be very short, but uh, the last one in a, is another great invention of, uh, of the past centuries that has shaped a lot of our reality, I believe. And it's a very simple, uh, object made of a beer, which I also really enjoy, gasoline from the cars, and a, a little piece of fabric. Um, and basically, the Molotov cocktail, I think, has uh, had a, a strong influence in general in the, in the past <laughs> revolutions. But I also think that, uh, for me, it, it also somehow uh, empowers the people with very simple tools. And I think it's quite important for me to reflect on that of course uh, it is linked with violence but also there I, I believe that especially today it's our role to uh, think what is violence and who has the monopole of the violence and you know what is violence is it a, a molotov cocktail or is it you know the fact that a few uh, billionaires own as much as a few billions of other people and uh, let's say in, in my practice as you say at when you started I think uh, acknowledging that each project is coming from a specific political situation, a specific economical situation, and, and somehow being aware of it, but also being critical towards it is really important. And I think when you're an architect, of course, you are always dealing with money because it's expensive to build. Uh, you are dealing with clients that you don't necessarily always agree with, but you do need to stand for something and uh, to somehow accept or not accept the project you don't want to do and, and be aware that you are part of a, a certain industry. And maybe the last project I will show, it's uh, a project that we did quite a while ago as well uh, with Daniel Zamarbid. And we were asked to present our young office at the Swiss Architectural Museum in Basel. 
and we didn't really feel like showing our projects, uh, but rather to use this excuse to do a little research project. And this was uh, the moment, uh, this was exactly at the moment of uh, the maiden revolution in Ukraine or the maiden square revolution. And uh, we had a few friends in Ukraine. Uh, we, we, they are still very good friends. We collaborate with them very often. Also, uh, they are architects. We had visited them a few times, did lecture there. And uh, they kept on sending us pictures, and we were really impressed, first of all, by the, the, the power of the opposition. And they were surprisingly not scared of the cops and really ready to overthrow the power. And that was really impressive to see how organized they were. Um, also quite scary in a way, you know, it was a very heavy violence. Um, but it was also amazing to see how they got organized and what they built on Maiden Square. So what we uh, decided to do for this uh, little exhibition was rather to do a survey. So together with this Ukrainian friends, we did a, a specific survey of all the buildings that were built during this temporary occupation of the square. And it was quite amazing to see how creative and all the amazing things that were built by the protester to occupy the square. And it was going you know, from houses, uh, schools, uh, places to resist, uh, fitness. They had built all these strange things to somehow live on the square and survive in the cold. So that was really interesting for us uh, to do this survey and, and also to share it. And then to show the, the result of it, we did a publication and a, and a, a little video. And to show the video, we, we built this installation that was made with the, the famous uh, shields that were initially owned by the police, the riot police in Ukraine, but were pretty quickly stolen by the protester and also started to be self-built. Um, so we, we built a tent uh, with, with, this, uh, with these elements. And in the tent, you had the, the, the video of the survey. And that's it. That was the, the last object. Um, yeah, I mean, I would be very happy to have questions and continue the discussion. It was a bit of a quick presentation. I didn't go in depth of any project, but the idea was to give you or try to share a bit the interest of my practice and the way I, I do it and the way I see architecture. Thank you, Leopold. Thank you. It's indeed triggered so many <laughs> questions to discuss. And I remember uh, the last project, uh, I think it was in SAM, in Swiss Architecture Museum. Yes. I even got a feeling that I got a, uh, yeah, I remember it very clear. Uh, it was very cool. Um, yeah, and uh, speaking about the self-organizations and the, as you said, collaborations, and uh, uh, you started uh, that collaboration is very important in your practice. And I just want to uh, probably start the discussion uh, from this point. How much collaboration actually affects your work, or let's say your design thinking, or how much your final result uh, kind of uh, change depend on the collaborators? And uh, from which point you start to integrate um, yeah, your collaborators in the in the in the strategy of design in uh, in exact design uh, decisions. How is it organized? Uh, I believe it's different than different um, projects, but it would just uh, would be interesting to see how do you tackle this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I think it's always important to to remember that in general, uh, architecture, even if there's only one architect, is a big collaboration. No? You collaborate with a client, and I think we always talk about. Uh, participative process but when you build a house for a client it's a participative process you know you have to listen to your client they have desire they have a certain amount of money they have so it's a, it's a collaboration with a the client then of course it's a collaboration with engineer with technicians and then later on it's always a collaboration with builders and i think it's important to to remember that it's a collaboration that uh, you are not only there to give order to the builders but you also constantly have to learn from them and their skills and share with them and, and make it possible. So first of all is even if you do it alone as an architect, I really believe or see architecture as a collaborative um, job. You know, you collaborate with a lot of people. It's very far from being an artist, uh, at least for me, very far from being an artist, developing your own practice in your own studio, you know, with very little constraint. So this is something that is, uh, for me, is, it's very important and I, re I really enjoy it. And I think the collaboration you're talking about, which is uh, maybe more uh, interesting, is collaborating with other architects as well. And uh, 
this is something I've done often, but uh, for me, it, it's not a, a necessity. I also do project on my own. Uh, and in, in the project I do on my own, of course, I control the, the design. So for me, it's not always necessary to be a collaboration, but I really like uh, that each project is an adventure. So if I can do it with another architect uh, and collaborate, I think it's always, uh, it's always great. And of course, it has an influence on the design. And I think, of course, it also uh, force you to sometimes re-question your uh, self-obsessions and, and uh, the fact that creativity is something that we are often linked with identity or the fact that you know we are a designer or I am a designer. And it's not always easy to collaborate. And I mean, I'm not going to pretend it's easy to collaborate. Some collaboration work really well, some other not. Uh, with Daniel Zamabid, we collaborated for many years because together we really managed to design as a, as a duo together. And it really worked. And with some other people, it's a different type of collaboration. Sometimes you have a, someone who's doing more the job of the local architect or someone uh, does more the technical job or, you know, it, it really depends. But uh, for me, it's more the idea that architecture is always you know, not a personal obsession, but really many, many people coming together. And I think for me, it's also very clear with the engineer, but even more with the with the builders. And this is something I wish to develop even more, I think, to really be able to develop the project together with an industry and craftsmen is really amazing. Yeah, indeed. I was actually, I didn't mean so much about other architects. To me, it was more how do you tackle, uh, especially in small scale, certain design, do you have just, uh, how would say, understanding of the direction which you would like to explore, or uh, do you already have like more or less particular design and then collaboration is like to find the partner who can do exactly what you kind of already envision. So that that's kind of uh, more. No, I see, that's also an interesting question. I, I, well, I think, as you said, it depends on the project, but there is an idea that, um, you know, when I work in this kind of participatory process, they often talk about uh, co-construction and this idea that the project can evolve through the construction. And I personally, I don't really believe in that. I actually think that the role of the architect is to plan a construction site, plan it in collaboration with the worker, but it's something you have to do beforehand. I think if you start a construction and then on the way start realizing things and try to change them, then we, we also failed at our job. I think our, you know, the first job of an architect is to conduct the construction site. And I think to do that, uh, our role is somehow to have a, a global vision and to prepare by doing all this collaboration. So um, often I get faced to this. Uh, sorry, I think, I think uh, somehow you, you got muted. Can you Am I back? Something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't like so much this idea that you design as it goes. I, I think it's interesting. I'm, I think improvisation in architecture is definitely an interesting topic. But in, in my case, I also discovered that when, I mean, it's our power as architect. I think if you prepare something well, you have the drawings, you have the dimension, construction can go really fast. If, if you start improvising on site, everything will take five times longer. So uh, I think it's something that uh, I find it's our strength in a way. We are able to envision the construction and, and prepare all the documents that are needed so that if, when everyone is on site, the builders, everyone knows where they are going. And uh, Yeah, that that's sense, true. Uh, but um, probably since we already have discussion, we can, uh, we can stop sharing screen. Um, or yeah, if, you, if you want you to, yeah. we can stop on some image which you like the most. Um, yeah, uh, just continuing with this discussion with, let's say, role of, um, uh, of, of the idea of something, what you envision, how do you adjust it to uh, realities. Um, you said that small projects, it's a bit of, it's kind of a test ground for the big ideas or the big, bigger projects. And here my question is, when you do these projects, just like the small projects or installations, 
do you already have these ideas which you'd like to test uh, or it's more again certain sphere of interest which you have and which you develop and kind of formulate through the small installations and then you continue developing them in the big project so kind of is it really the test ground or is it all uh, um, yet the laboratory where you develop something to test uh, do, do you understand yeah 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 no i think it, it would be a lie to say that i have a greater plan and i i use them just to test i think when I, I meant by testing is just a, a way to free, you know, free inspiration and, and try ideas. But uh, the way I work is, is never with a greater plan. It's, I think each project is the occasion to do something unique. And for me, each situation uh, somehow is unique. So I, I see my work, even if it doesn't look like it sometimes, as very site specific in a way. I, and not only linked to a site in the romantic idea of the topography. Uh, when, when I mean a site is a specific social situation, a specific economical situation. And I really try to somehow uh, start the project from what, what is there, what is the reality of the project. And in, in that sense, I think it creates a very eclectic practice. You know? I think uh, I never use uh, three times the same material, maybe some material come back, but in general, uh, if I discover or if I'm invited in a new place, I will try to react to what's there as much as possible. So I think what's somehow defined my practice is definitely not specific material or specific ideas, uh, but it's more uh, a protocol, a way to look at a project, uh, look at a site, look at a situation and try to somehow have a creative response to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and small projects are a test ground in the fact that every time it's a very specific uh, situation. But it, you're right; it doesn't mean that then I will, you know, take this idea at a larger scale. But I think it's more a way to test, uh, yeah, to test this kind of uh, um, this kind of practice and this this ability to react to a situation. I was like talking with principle uh, system of work uh, rather than uh, tools of work um yeah that's uh, that's very interesting uh, i will just remind everyone that uh, the one who's interested can write questions or you could also turn on your camera and ask it uh, the questions in voice uh, it's like up to you uh, so just uh, just the one who wants to say something just rise up a hand and please ask the question directly or if you feel like you don't want to turn on the camera by this or another reason just write it in the uh, in the chat there's a question uh, by me I, there's a question by Leo to Leo <laughs> with the same L. So maybe I can answer to this question. Yeah, sure. But, but, but the question just is, please, what are please. the challenges and limitation of being a traveling architect and how do you deal with this? And I think it's an interesting question because I ask myself this question all the time. <laughs> so it's interesting for myself, at least, uh, because there are a lot of uh, limitation and a lot of liberty and somehow liberty comes with limitation uh or constraint you know it's it seems a bit uh, absurd but uh i think we cannot have it all so definitely uh i am i am choosing my liberty and i think uh, for me traveling and being very flexible is a very important uh, aspect and of course the limitation it has i would say the first one is that uh, i cannot have a big office i think having a small office allows you to do this kind of uh, project as soon as you have a big machine, you are also uh, forced to choose a project that are part of the same economical standard because you need to feed your office coming from Switzerland. If I had a big office in Switzerland, I would need project in Switzerland to be able to pay the employee in Switzerland. And there's no way I could uh, make my office survive by doing project uh, in Bahrain or project in Portugal. So I think it comes with a, a very small structure, which push this idea of collaboration more and more. So I'm getting smaller and, and smaller as an office. And uh, at the moment, uh, let's say there's only one uh, person working 50% with me on a specific project. Otherwise, it's only that it's employed. All the other people are collaborators in the sense that they have their own entity and we collaborate on a project on equal ba basis. So that's one of the limitation. Uh, and I, of course there's other limitation I think uh, there's a question of size when you have a smaller office you can also it gets difficult to do very big project it gets also more difficult to do a, a lot of competition 
except if you do them through collaboration as well. So a lot of limitation and it's all uh, choices. But I think for me, being able to be uh, free to do architecture in different places, to really see it as a, as a medium to travel the world is, is the most important. Yeah, it looks like the way we collaboration becomes more and more sustainable way of working, which allows us actually uh, the most interesting work to do the most interesting work and the most interesting project. But as you said about the, your corporateness in Australia, they were so good that they were able to build everything by the model. So the better corporateness are, your collaborators are, the less architects need to travel. This <laughs> probably That's could true. be <laughs> the other side of the medal. Uh, in your lecture, you spoke uh, a lot about values and values in architecture. And um, here kind of just probably not even a question, but probably proposal to elaborate this a bit more. What is the highest for you personally value in architecture? What uh, satisfy you the most uh, from uh, which achievements in architecture uh, makes like gives you this kind of feeling of satisfaction that yes, this project worked out? Well, I, I mean, it's quite, uh, maybe it's a cheesy answer, but uh, it's when the clients are happy. And I think uh, that's also a beautiful thing of temporary project and small project is, you know, you're not only testing an idea, you're actually testing if it works. So, you know, if you design a space for a festival, to, the week after you are in this space with a hundred other people or a thousand other people and you see if it works or not. And uh, for me, when you see that you have, you know, you always imagine not only your space but also the way it's going to be used and when you actually are in there and you realize wow it, it worked and sometimes it doesn't work but when it works for me that's the biggest satisfaction it's not to see the space it's to see that the space creates the atmosphere that i was hoping to create and this you only see it by the satisfaction of the users and uh, that's why as i said for me it's very far from uh, sculptural work it, it's really about creating a, a space that has quality for the people who will use it and, and that will create a certain atmosphere. And in that sense, I think that's why I was so fascinated by working for festivals, because it's so immediate. You, know? you, you, you put a bright light and the party will be completely different than if it's completely dark. Or you built a good speaker, the party will be very different from if you have a shit speaker. And these very simple things uh, allow you to you know, get results. But for me, it also allows you to get great satisfaction no? when you create a space and it creates a very specific atmosphere. You know, I was talking about this inflatable shelter. It's a very simple idea. You know, we did it very quickly, but I had this kind of vision and then the party was better than I thought. I didn't thought it would be so dark. I didn't think it would go so crazy in the party that it would be so sweaty and humid. And then you're like, ah, it actually really creates a unique space. And, and for me, that's, that's the satisfaction. Yeah, it's a, I like your very straightforward answer. I remember when I was... It's a value, no? You talk about value, but for me... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, the value uh, is the idea that architecture is, is for people. And I remember when I was a student, I read, uh, like, there was a words of one Russian philosopher which somehow stayed in my mind. And it was like, the only... Uh, men can call great things only the one which everyone and every time likes. <laughs> that to me, it was like, since then... Really important that any project uh, should satisfy locals uh, from uh, elder generation and the uh, younger generation from all, all around the world and work in between the contexts. And here I would like to ask you probably another question. Uh, and I still I would urge our students and uh, everyone who listen to lecture probably take this chance, ask the questions directly to Leopold. Probably tomorrow you will have such a chance. Uh, so mm, uh, my question would be uh, about the local context. Uh, you showed projects from uh, very different parts of the world. And um, my question is how local culture, how local context, again, affect your way of thinking, your way of working, or uh, was there anything uh, you had to take into account which somehow also affect the architecture? Uh, or you've been just lucky to work with a same type of people all around the world. No, I, I think it's, it's, of course, it's every time a completely different experience. And at least I try every time to do a project that somehow uh, answer to a specific culture. Of course, the danger 
uh, when you travel a lot is you don't necessarily have a deep understanding of the culture. So sometimes it can be a bit superficial or it can also be a, a little bit of an exotic uh, point of view, you know, that you have on culture. And I think that's definitely a risk. At the same time, I think, uh, you know, if you, if you are curious and if you are trying to make the effort, you also come with a fresh eye and you can also see things in a culture as a foreigner that uh, people don't necessarily notice anymore. And I think it's also a quality, you know, to, to arrive to a place with a fresh eye. Uh, so for me, it's very important to react to, to, to a site. And of course, every time it's an adventure, you know, every time there's, there's different uh, knowledge, different craft, different flows. And, uh, but I never had a bad experience, I have to say, you know, it's anywhere, it's always different. But uh, if you somehow collaborate instead of, of impose, uh, I think you always get a great experience. And everywhere people have amazing skills, it's just not the same. You know, if you try to, to get someone from Bahrain to do a Swiss carpentry or I don't know what, it's, you know, it, it's definitely not going to work. Uh, so you have to be aware of what are the, the skills. And for me, the first step usually is to go see workers and see crafts and see what people are able to do. And I think from at least that's my ideal. Maybe I don't always manage to do it, but I think that's how it should be. It sounds Leopold, absolutely... I have a, Leopold, I have a question. Um, yes. Thank you so much for the, the last answer, actually. Um, I think it was very profound to hear that you are fully aware of the potentials of the threats of being the, you know, the traveling architects, but also of the positive aspects of that. So I have, um, and you kind of gave us a very specific and curated lecture tonight, which was uh, really extraordinary to hear. I have a banal question. You spoke about, very profoundly about context, about materiality, about craftsmen, about understanding this relationship among these three entities, let's say. And then you did the black and white uh, lecture. Can you elaborate on that? And why is that necessary? <laughs> I don't think it's necessary at all. Uh, to be honest, I mean, it's a boring answer, but uh, uh, a year ago or a bit more, I, I prepared a lecture and somehow I got annoyed with my practice because it was so eclectic. Everything was different color. Everything was looked different. And I couldn't myself see anymore what was the common den denominator in my practice. And I thought that the somehow the eclectic uh, aspect, the, the color, the look, the light, it was every time was so different. The photographer is every time also often different. So I thought, okay, I need to somehow put them more on the same level to try to see what is the relation between this project. And in that process, I put everything in black and white. And since then it stays because the file where that I used to do lecture, it's now all turned into black and white. It seems <laughs> like you want to print it, you know, in a black and white uh, manner. Yes, yeah. But no, it takes too... a, I think it takes away a lot of what you try to explain with words. I think maybe it's interesting because we have to imagine the type of, you know, the cladding in the um, Australian project or the type of wood or different woods that you spoke about. So basically you have this, sensitivity towards the different different materials or the pink marble but it was um the effect or the atmosphere that you also spoke about it's also created with the chromatics of each of these materials and the way the shadow is casted on them and it would be of course we can explore it by going you know to other let's say instruments to see the same project but i just wanted somehow it it speaks against of certain qualities that you were accentuating um, through your talk. So. Okay, point taken. I think I will go back. A few people made me this comment lately when I did a lecture. So I will go back to color. But, but it was really uh, yeah, trying, you know, when you do collaborative uh, practice and keep on changing, and I was working with Daniel and not anymore, at some point it's hard to to find what is the common denominator between all these projects. So it was part of this process. The other thing that I have to admit is that uh, I'm very bad with color. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why I think I, now it's simple. I only use raw material, which all have color. Well, this is what I, I, I don't need to choose them, but exactly. I find that the few times I try and, and uh, Daniel, who I was working with, was much more into color. And every time we had to choose color, I was regretting it, you know, 
always thought I was doing a bad choice. So this is one of the many things. Next time I have to use a color, even choose a painting, I will ask a painter or someone to help me <laughs> or to collaborate with me because I'm, I'm just not good at that. I think in a way I see spaces a bit in black and white. And maybe this is why I try this exercise, but uh, I will go back to color. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay, thank you so much. <clears throat> I think there's so, another hello? question from Moscow. Mm -hmm. there Please is read that. it, yep. What was the most memorable challenge you faced and solved in your career, other than the house in Lisbon? <laughs> yeah, that was a challenging one. Um, With a colorful marble. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Ura, that's a difficult question. I, there was a, I think each project is, is, I always manage to create challenge. Somehow I, I think I, I must like it. Um, but I'm trying to find a, a, a really hard one. I mean, surprisingly, I, it's going to not sound really interesting, but out of all of this project, the project I struggle the most is the project with the city of Geneva. <laughs> and working with the, the, the state workers of the city of Geneva is for me an endless, maybe not memorable, but really an endless challenge. And uh, it's quite crazy how the bureaucracy and when you get to that kind of scale, it, it can be really insane to manage to do a good project. And it's, it's quite crazy that it's, you know, it's, you can be in some very uh, far away country. You always find great ways to resolve it, but the bureaucracy in, in so-called developed country like Switzerland <laughs> can be really, uh, really difficult. And it's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge, I find, to be able to build good projects when you have uh, such a uh, pressure when you build for the state. And it's, uh, it's very difficult to to manage through the process. It's possible to win a competition, but then to manage to keep a project to its essence through all of these uh, endless um, loops is, is very difficult. But that's definitely not an interesting uh, answer. But I think it's an important one, you know, because I think it's far easier to win a competition than actually find a way through all this um, turbulent, let's say, momentums, which they will last for years. So basically, you spoke before about speed in which you are able to conceive, build and experience your projects. On the other hand, you will have this kind of long lasting negotiation with the you know, public workers at the city in order to hopefully create in a long term, like a long term change. So I think these different speeds of your projects were very um, very clear presented. I think also you reminded now the students about the necessity to be able to be to negotiate smartly within those public projects that we all in Europe have to face with over bureaucratic, um, let's say, situations. No, yeah, it has become clear to me, and it's not always uh, uh, good, but that. Architect to manage great architect to manage to build great things are not necessarily the best architect, but they are definitely the best at convincing client and and you know negotiating and managing to stay and keep the project good until the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure there's some amazing architects that we never acknowledge just because they are not good in this in this process. And it's maybe sadly, but it's it's a big part of our profession and it's part of the collaboration. Is you are not alone and. Uh, and uh, you have constantly to collaborate with other power, with clients, uh, with economies, and uh, it's, it's part of the job. But uh, uh, in my situation, you're right, I use small project to free myself a bit from that and maybe to get the patience to go through some uh, longer term project. But it can be very difficult. I have to say sometime I want to give up a project just because even if they are very important, it's so hard and so long, no? Sometimes it can be so long. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good to have these short and small projects to somehow survive the, the longer ones. I think that's the, the mix, it's, it's pretty crucial. You have Thank another you. question. Oh yeah. Thanks for the lecture. I liked your mixture of images, small question. Where did you study and how did you like it? 
uh, I studied in uh, Switzerland, actually. It's, it's funny be because I, before and after I travel a lot, but, uh, and moved a lot, but I did most of my study in uh, EPFL, which is the school in Lausanne, Switzerland. Um, I, of course, escaped for an Erasmus as uh, when I could, and I did also my diploma uh, somewhere else. Uh, but I did all my study there, and I have to say, I mean, I can be critical towards the school and some element, but that has no interest. What I can say is that uh, school was really amazing to meet other people and start collaboration. I'm saying that because uh, you are a lot of you are students. And for me, it was really uh, the place where I met other people with whom I kept on collaborating. And I keep on, you know, it created a, a network of friends of people of my age, my generation, uh, and we share interest. And for me, that was really amazing. So in the end, even if the school would have been not good, which actually I thought it was pretty good, but uh, for me, the, the, you know, the main interest in school is to be with other colleagues and, and make friends and prepare yourself for further collaboration. And uh, for me, still today, as I say, Noura, who I, I worked with, I was, you know, I met in school uh, and a lot of my friends, a lot of people I still collaborate with today, I met in school. So, yeah, for me, school was really amazing in that sense. Speaking about school, uh, you started in school and then you came back um, for them. Um, to teach in school and now you teach in Mindrizio and uh, what's for you the like what is for you then school uh, are you just sharing the knowledge or is there a certain like kind of platform of experimentation where you try to formulate for the discourse and if yes like in which way uh, do you have a certain narrative which you kind of prepare by yourself or you try to develop with the students and um, like generally role of teaching academic uh, occupation in your let's say real practice mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe first I have to admit that, I mean, I really enjoy teaching, but uh, I, I don't, I'm also not a born professor, so I don't think it's, uh, uh, I'm not an academic, academical person, let's say. For me, it's, it's something I can do on the side of my practice, but I would never let alone my practice for teaching. It's important to admit it. Uh, I don't think it makes necessarily a bad professor of me, but uh, for me, it's, it's, it goes together with my practice. And, and I have the chance to be uh, teaching an atelier now, which I think for me, it's the most interesting position. And it's important to, to remember that it's quite unique to architecture. Uh, in most other academical uh, fields, you have to be an academical professor with a PhD to teach in the school. And that means that most of the professors are, are not linked with uh, their professional practice. And I think in architecture, in, in the atelier part, it's quite amazing to have all these professional practitioners who share that with the student. And I really see it quite simple that in a way, uh, the goal of an atelier is for a semester or two semester to share uh, my practice with the student and to give them one example of how architecture can be envisioned. And of course, there is many, and thank God uh, to have a master, there is at least uh, 10 semester, so or more, but at least 10 semester, I think. Uh, so you can see 10 different ways or, or a bit less of, of practicing architecture. So what I try to do in my teaching is to, to share my interest. Of course, I'm also aware that, uh, and, and I encourage this, I think, you know, the student learn as much from themselves as uh, they can learn from me, and I can learn as much from them as well. So it's really a, kind of a research uh, that we do together. So usually I come, I come up with a theme or a topic that is close to my interest or my practice, and I try to share that. But then we always go through a research that always le leads us to somewhere else. Uh, and, and it's an amazing learning experience for myself, usually. So uh, to give you an example, uh, this semester, or the semester we finished a bit earlier in Mendezio, uh, we worked on the, uh, on the informal neighborhoods that are built around Lisbon. Uh, it's, Lisbon is a city that I know pretty well. And it's, it's been always really fascinating to see uh, the urbanism there and, and how, especially after the Carnation Revolution, entire neighborhood were built completely informally. So some of them are really like a favela, let's say really like shacks. 
uh, and some other now are three floors building, but they are completely illegal, fully built. The ur urbanism, it's fully uh, non-organized. People are, don't own the their property, of course. Uh, and and to, for me, reflecting on informality and seeing what people do without architect is a great way to somehow challenge what we are supposed to do as architect or if we are useful for anything. And usually the, the answer when you go in one of these amazing neighborhoods is that at least in terms of urban planning, it's really better when people do it themselves. <laughs> it's quite obvious. And, uh, and for me, this is one of the things I try to share with the, the student is this interest for what I like to call uh, the neo vernacular, which is things that are built without architect by people themselves out of mean, but not in a romantic or passeist uh, way. Today, you know what what people are building today, today uh, as part of a popular modern culture, uh, but without, uh, yeah, without architect, without urban planner, without the control of the state. So this is usually uh, this is what interests me, and that's what I try to share when I teach. Yeah, that's very interesting, and the term the vernacular, which exposes the actual needs of people, how they actually see their homes. Uh, Tina, would you like to, to ask some, some other questions? Or... I think it was actually a perfect conclusion. We started the day with the reviews. It was great to meet you, Leo, and to hear your comments to the students. I was hoping that some of the students that you asked questions during the day would ask you questions now, but they're, they're tired and just looking <laughs> happy that it's over. So I think we had a great discussion, also sharing your thoughts on how you teach. And uh, I think it's extraordinarily important. Um, and yes, um, so let's look forward to challenge you with some other question for the next lecture. And it would be great to collaborate in the future through this channel of TU or somewhere else. But yeah, thank you for your time. And thank you, Artem, for organizing this. I think it was very inspiring, profound, and also critical. So. Yeah, Unfortunately, but... online. <laughs> so next time you come to Vienna, okay? Yes, Since we say... know that you like to travel, so now we have to. <laughs> yes, well, I have to say now that I'm a father, it has changed a bit also my ability to travel, but uh, I'm trying to continue. Uh, but yes, I would love to share a beer with all of you. I'm sure you're, the students are tired after the, this long day of both reviews and working for the review or towards the review. So. It would be nice to decompress and all share a, a beer together, but uh, hopefully another time. And uh, yeah, thank you again, Artem. I also hope we can share a beer in Geneva one day, uh, if you go there to teach as well. And uh, yeah, I hope to all meet you soon. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you very Bye. much, everyone. Thank you and goodbye. Bye. Ciao, ciao.